So this particular topic that we're going to be going through is uh, is called rush the rush protocol or rapid ultrasound and shock. And uh, basically, it's there's many different ways to evaluate somebody who's got undifferentiated hypotension using ultrasound. One group uh, recently came out with this paper called Abdominal and Cardiac Evaluation with Sonography and Shock, or ACEs, basically using ultrasound in the setting of undifferentiated hypotension to try to pick up an early diagnosis and then guide the therapy in a goal-directed way. And this included multiple modalities, including cardiac, peritoneal, pleural, looking at the IVC as a non-invasive measure of central venous pressure, and also looking at the aorta. And I liked their approach. Uh, but it was a little bit, um, you know, it's kind of here and there, and uh, I, I agree with all the things they said. It's just that I, I like this approach better, the rush exam, or rapid ultrasound in shock and evaluation of the critically ill. Uh, and this was published in February in the um, Emergency Medicine Clinics of North America. And the reason I like this approach to it better is because it's a little bit more organized, and in the heat of the battle, you know, as an emergency physician, I like simple algorithms that can kind of keep me focused on my patients. And so I'm not trying to remember a paper or a chart or a diagram. I'm just like, okay, what was that uh, mnemonic again? Rush, that's right. Rapid ultrasound and shock. Okay, how do I work this? Well, really, it's, it's similar to the ABCs in a way in the sense that you really got to remember three things, the pump, the tank, and the pipes. So as long as you can remember these three topics, the pump, the tank, and the pipes, then you can do this rapid ultrasound and shock, okay? So it keeps coming back to that. And we'll start with the pump. And uh, for always, now you'll remember uh, the Austin Powers uh, movie when it comes to evaluating somebody in shock. And uh, it's, it's really an evaluation of the global LV function uh, and also for any obstructive processes that could be going on, specifically a pericardial effusion or pericardial tamponade. Um, uh, and RV strain in the setting of pulmonary embolism. Recall that the three places you place the probe in order to evaluate the pump is the parasternal lung, the apical four chamber, and the subxiphoid. And uh, we'll start with that uh, subxiphoid view. This, the, the interesting thing about the subxiphoid view, it's probably the one that people reach for first, uh, certainly the one that I reach for first when I've got a patient in shock, just want to see if their heart is moving or not, you know, kind of what's going on with their you know, in the setting of a code, is the heart moving? This is the first sort of uh, view I get. And the weird thing about the subxiphoid view as opposed to the other views, you know from anatomy that the heart is sort of on the left side of the body. We think about patients with left-sided chest pain, the heart being on the left side of the body. Well, with this um, subxiphoid view, we actually don't aim the probe towards the left side. We use the liver as our window to see the heart. And so that's why we start at that liver edge, eventually moving up into the subxiphoid, aiming the beam of the ultrasound at the patient's chin, once again using the liver as the window. We never aim it towards the left. If we aim to the left, we get the lung, the chest in the way, and the image is gone. So um, the, I always know I'm looking at a subxiphoid view because I can see that the liver is at the top of the screen. We can see the liver up here as well. It's a four-chambered view. When I've got the indicator of the patient's right, it's a right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium. We can see that this heart is actually moving over here pretty well. The, um, the other thing that I really like about the subxiphoid view is that I tend to find more pericardial effusions in this subxiphoid view than I do in the other views of the heart. It seems to be, at least for whatever reason, the heart is sort of heavy. It hangs out in its posterior pericardium, squishing fluid anteriorly. And that's why I feel like I can see pericardial fusions much better when I'm approaching it in the subxiphoid view than I can in the other views. So in a code situation, this is the view I reach for just to see if there's any uh, contractility. And then also um, when I'm looking for any pericardial fusions, this is the first view that sort of comes to mind. And so, which is not surprising why in the FAST exam, there's two views of the heart, this view in the parasternal long, um, we always start with this view in the FAST exam because it is good for the pericardial fusions. Now, speaking of parasternal lung, indicators aim to the patient's left hip or left elbow. If their arm is at their side, it's their left elbow. And, um, and this is, as its name suggests, a long axis view of the heart. Para means next to, sternum, 
long. So think about how the heart kind of lines itself up along the long axis of the body, and then you're going to try to get the sound along the longest axis of the heart. And so you know, you're trying to get it along here with the indicator aimed down towards the patient's left hip or left elbow. And that's why when, um, when you do this, it puts the apex on the indicator side of the screen. So the indicator is over here, and since we're aiming the indicator towards the apex, that's why we see the apex over here. Now, this is a three-chambered view of the peristernal long. This is the left atrium. Here's the left ventricle, and this is the aortic outflow track up here with the right ventricle sitting up here. Uh, and what's happening is this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve comes up and smacks into the septum of the heart, and also uh, the interventricular septum and the posterior wall they come together towards an imaginary like red blood cell sitting right here in the middle of the left ventricle in normal patients. So we should see that nice movement of the uh, anterior septal leaf of the mitral valve, and we should also see good movement of the interventricular septum and the posterior wall as they come towards each other. And we can see here, this is just the, um, the schematic diagram here of this three-chambered view, left atrium, left ventricle, right ventricle, and this is the aortic outflow track here. And in a normal patient, this is exactly what it looks like. We can see the left atrium here. We can see the left ventricle. And not seen that well in this particular cut is the aortic outflow track, but this is where it lies. If we, if we angle the probe slightly one way or the other, we could probably see this aortic valve come into view a little bit better. This is the right ventricle up here. This is our interventricular septum running along here. And this is our posterior wall. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to this mitral valve right here. Notice how that mitral valve comes up and smacks into the septum right there. See that? <clears throat> so over, uh, over here, it's away from the septum. It's closed. And now it's open. And when you see that mitral valve smack in the septum like that, see how it can smack that septum as I'm controlling it right now? That's normal. We want to see that happen, OK? So this is a normal peristernal long axis, and this is just the overlay of that, of that schematic diagram for you. Now, in this peristernal long axis, it's also possible to see some other things going on. What do you think is going on in this particular view? Yeah, there's a, there's a nice effusion back here. Um, we can see it uh, posteriorly as well as anteriorly. What do you suppose this circle is right here? I didn't talk about this yet. What we're seeing there is the descending aorta. After the, after the uh, blood leaves the heart, comes out of the aorta, kind of goes behind the plane of the screen here, and then makes its way sort of you know down the body towards uh, the abdominal aorta. But this is the actual very proximal section of the thoracic uh, aorta as it's heading down towards the feet. And we can see this effusion here. On the left side in the peristernal long axis, sometimes it's confusing whether the effusion is in the pericardium or in the pleura because the heart's sort of off to the left a little bit there. So you can see sometimes effusions on the left side in this pair. You can see effusions in the left chest sometimes in this peristernal long axis. But one thing to keep in mind is that if this effusion is wedged between or anterior to the thoracic aorta, in this case the effusion walks anterior to this thoracic aorta and wedges itself between the posterior wall of the left atrium and the, th and the thoracic aorta, well, then that's definitely pericardial. If this effusion was to walk down behind the thoracic aorta, then it would be pleural. Yet another reason why I like that sub view to confirm a pericardial effusion, because I don't get into any confusion with the chest then. I just see liver, RV, LV in the peristernal, in the sub view, and the Pericardial effusion is seen nicely above the RV. Now, the third view uh, of the heart is this apical four chamber. And uh, we can see here how uh, the apex comes to the top of the screen up here, because that's where we place the probe. We basically place the transducer right along the PMI, or po point of maximal impulse. And the heart is beating at that point. That's why we see the apex up here right at the skin line. And then as we look distally, we can see the chambers, the right ventricle, left ventricle, and then the right atrium and left atrium in the far field. This is with the indicator towards the patient's right. So sub view, indicator of the patient's right. Peristernal long, 
we put it to the patient's left, but then apical four chamber, we're back to the patient's right again. And this is what it looks like as a schematic diagram. And once again, this is what happens when we see some pathology. The pathology is clearly demonstrated here. Um, what do you think an EKG finding might be in this particular setting? Electrical alternands. And you said low voltage. And you're both right. It turns out that in the setting of pericardial tamponade, the most common EKG finding is low voltage. Um, the second most common finding is this, electrical alternands. But look how low that voltage is there. And on a chest x-ray, it's impossible to differentiate between a big pericardial effusion and just cardiomegaly. They look th really the same. You, you just see like a large cardiac silhouette. So really, we can't rely on ECG findings or chest x-ray to make this diagnosis. It's all about the ultrasound here. And this is what a normal apical four chamber uh, looks like. We can see the uh, left ventricle is here, the right ventricle is here, the right atrium is down here, and the left atrium is here. Every once in a while, we see the aortic valve come into view right there. I don't know if you saw that. And when the aortic valve comes into view like that, we call that here. I'll back it up for you right there. This is called actually no longer called the apical four, but the apical five chamber, the fifth chamber sort of being this imaginary chamber of the aortic valve here. So we see LV, RV, RA, LA, and this aortic valve. And the first view I usually do is a subcostal view. Now, if you look at the screen, what's the problem here? My depth is too low. It's at 7.5, and I'm just seeing barely part of the right ventricle. So I want to go down on the depth. In fact, when you do a subcostal view, you want to go down quite far on the depth. And the screen looks a little dark to me. I'm going to turn up the gain a little bit here now. And what we're looking at here, this is the right ventricle, left ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, and there's the septum. This is just a very quick overview to kind of get your feet wet. Um, so that's a subcostal view. Again, if you look at the probe here, the indicator is towards his right. I just looked at the liver, and I saw the liver, and then I saw the heart. That's the way you do it. You start at the liver, you slide up into that faucet till you see the heart. Now, there's another view called the parasternal lawn, where you take that indicator towards the patient's left elbow, and now we can see the heart on the screen. It looks pretty small. We're going to need to decrease the depth uh, and to, to have it take up most of the screen. Left atrium, left ventricle, aortic valve, aortic outflow tract, this way, right ventricle. Okay. Now that's a parasternal long view. If I want to do a parasternal short view, I simply take my probe and then I rotate it 90 degrees. And now you look on the screen and we'll see a parasternal short view. Looks like sometimes we call this the fish mouth view right here because it looks like a fish mouth there. So this is the left... Um, this whole thing is the left ventricle. You can imagine squeezing it together on itself like a donut. And this is the right ventricle up here. Okay. And then the fourth view, we, in the fourth view, you want to have the indicator here towards the patient's right again. You're sort of right underneath that left nipple aiming towards the spine. And that will get that view there will get you the heart on the screen to stand straight up with the septum standing top to bottom. That's the septum there. This is the left ventricle, right ventricle. Notice how the right ventricle is about two-thirds the size of the left ventricle, and that's normal. When that right ventricle gets really big and approaches the size or even bigger than the left ventricle on an apical view, that's considered right ventricular strain and is suspicious in the right setting for uh, pulmonary embolism. So that's why this apical view can be very helpful. This is the pericardium around the outside of this uh, right and left ventricles there. You can look for effusions this way. Okay, that's... So, um, now that you've seen some normal stuff, let's talk about what type of uh, dysfunction we can see. Well, I mentioned that um, with the global LV function, it's good to look at the mitral valve, the anterior septal leaflet of it, and also at the qualitative LV function. And just to pull this up for you here, uh, we can see two patients' hearts here. One of them is quite abnormal, and the other one is normal. And I think it's probably pretty easy for you to see that this mitral valve here is actually not coming up and smacking into that septum at all. And you can see, even as I back it up here, I freeze the image, I back it up, it's really not making any meaningful headway. This is about as far as it gets, not even halfway across this opening to make its way towards the septum. So right off the bat, um, we're concerned about this patient having a decreased LV function. 
um, just because that valve doesn't come up and s smack the septum. The second problem is that we see back here in this left ventricle, if we're an imaginary red blood cell sitting right here, we don't make out the fact that very well that this interventricular septum and this posterior wall are coming together to any meaningful degree the way it is over here. You can see up here there's pretty good delta here in the uh, chamber sizes, you know, between the end systole and end diastole. There's a good difference in that in that chamber size because the interventricular septum and posterior wall are really squeezing together really well. And so um, right off the bat, we look at this heart and we go, okay, definitely decreased LV function. Now let's apply that to this heart here. What do you guys think is going on here? First thing we look at there is that interventricular septum and the mitral valve. Does that valve come up and smack that septum? It may be hard to see just by looking at the video, but when I freeze it, we can see right there, it smacks that septum pretty well. See that? Who's your mitral valve? Who's your mitral valve? Right there. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So, I know it's early. Here's the, uh, here's the other thing we look at back here. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's contracting. There's good squeeze there. And this is indeed a normal LV functioning heart right here. Okay. Now, how about this one? Definitely not. That one's not moving towards the septum at all, no matter how much I want to hope that it does. And then over here, that septum, that posterior wall, really not making any meaningful um, motion towards each other. So this patient's got poor LV function. And then how about this one here? Yeah, poor LV function. And so that's the idea. When you're looking at these hearts up in the ICU, I want you to differentiate them into a normal, uh, normal functioning LV and a poor LV functioning LV because really this can help guide the fluid resuscitation, right? So if you've got somebody who's hypotensive and the nurse is immediately reaching for the fluids to you know, resuscitate the patient, I would be very careful about giving this heart a lot of fluids here because this heart won't be able to handle it and could eventually end up, the patient could eventually end up in, in um, with pulmonary edema, with congestive heart failure. So that's kind of how I like to gauge my resuscitation. A heart like this is a lot more likely to need some inotropic help to make it squeeze more versus fluids in order to correct the blood pressure. So that's one thing to look at. The other thing to look at in terms of the pump is if there's a pericardial effusion causing the problem. We've had many, many cases now of medical students using ultrasound and stumbling across a pericardial effusion in a patient who's got chest pain, shortness of breath, or hypotension. Over and over again, I come across these. I don't, my, the medical students do. Why would you have a pericardial effusion? Uh, it could be traumatic. You could have uh, pericarditis result and all that inflammation can start to develop some fluid collection there. Um, malignancies can cause pericardial effusions, like malignancies can cause fluid collections all over the body. One place is around the heart. And also, it's common to see this in patients who are uremic. Now, in trauma patients who immediately have a, um, a stab wound to the chest, to the heart, uh, acutely, that pericardium can only accumulate anywhere from 80 to 200 cc's before the pressure inside the pericardium exceeds that of the ability of the right ventricle to fill. Okay, so acutely, all of us in this room right now, we don't really tolerate much fluid in our pericardium. But the longer it takes to build up, the more the patient can tolerate. And so it's not uncommon to see patients, for example, have uremic pericarditis who have, you know, pericardial effusions greater than a liter. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. And um, specifically defined tamponade is when you have basically diastolic collapse of the right heart. So normally during diastole, the right heart should be filling, but instead you've got this thing where the right heart during diastole the, uh, the right ventricular wall collapses during diastole. So we should see, you know, during diastole, the right and left ventricles fill, but in the case of pericardial tamponade, the LV will try to fill, even though they're usually pretty empty looking LVs because our blood can't get around to it, but the LV will try to fill. Meanwhile, the RA and the RV collapse. It looks like there's a little um, alien in there jumping up and down on the, on the uh, right ventricle. It looks like what some people call the trampoline effect. So that's kind of what you're thinking about in terms of um, uh, 
a sonographic definition of tamponade. One of the things we see also around hearts are epicardial fat pads. So epicardial fat pads can appear uh, heteroechoic, meaning that some parts are hyperechoic and some parts are hypoechoic. And they're tacked down to the right ventricle and the left ventricle, and so they move with the heart. So as the heart is beating, as the heart is moving, these fat pads are moving with the heart. Okay, so that's one way to differentiate that. Um, and fluid collections really should be anechoic. The problem is where you get into when there's a clot around the heart. So clots around the heart are not heteroechoic the way a fat pad is, but they're isoechoic with the clot is one similar echogenicity across its um, clot, and it's the same echogenicity as, as the liver. So if you're looking at this in a sub xiphoid view, you'll notice that the clot looks a lot like liver. It looks a lot like thyroid. It's very isochoic with those organs. So we'll see some examples here. What do you think about this one? Well, this patient's um, RV is actually working quite well. It expands during diastole and fills. It doesn't have that trampoline effect. And if you look around, there's definitely a pericardial effusion here. What view of the heart is this? Sub yeah, subxiphoid, exactly. Because the liver's here. Whenever I see liver at the top of the screen, the sound had to go through the liver to see the heart. And so that's the tip off to the, this is a subxiphoid four chamber view. And, you know, I look at this patient, a little bit of history. This patient does have a lot of chronic um, medical problems, including. Um, uh, they're on dialysis, and so in some of these patients, you can see loculations if they've had um, these fluid collections there for a while, and I think that's what these little striations are in this pericardium or loculations, okay? And this is a very small pericardial effusion. I would not be running to grab a needle to drain this one here, especially because I don't really see the sonographic findings of tamponade. The other question people always ask me is, how much fluid is around this patient's heart? And, you know, I don't... Um, to, to really decide that, you'd probably need to do some kind of volumetric, you know, scan of the heart in three dimensions and then take the area under the curve using calculus or something that I don't know anything about. So the answer is I don't know. But what I do is um, during the end of systole, when the uh, ventricle pulls away from the pericardium at its maximal point, I would uh, then drop a caliper and measure and you know, generally speaking, pericardial effusions one centimeter or less don't have to be dealt with in acute fashion the way larger pericardial effusions do. But if you're reporting this to somebody, you would say, I see a pericardial effusion uh, between, you know, especially between their RV and the uh, anterior pericardium, and it measures, you know, 0.9 millimeters or two centimeters. I'm worried about this patient because they have a two centimeter stripe of fluid in the pericardium. That's how I would communicate that to somebody. Now this is an interesting uh, case here. What view of the heart is this? Same, Same subxiphoid view. And just what do you think about this overall? Yeah, so it's pretty thick in interventricular septum. Okay, I see that definitely. What else? So absolutely, you're all saying the right things. Um, there's some fluid here, and there's some fluid over here. And in between these, that fluid, there's this isochoic material here that's the same echogenicity as the liver. And indeed, that is a clot. What else do we see? Yeah, it looks like there's a little monkey in here jumping up and down on this patient's right ventricle, that, that it's got this paradoxical RV motion. And that is what helps to define the tamponade uh, physiology going on here. And so there's another little thing I want to point out to you with this heart that I didn't notice initially the first time I looked at it, but the more I stare at this clip, the more it starts to become apparent, is that this patient, and it's normal to have this, but it's just a little epicardial fat pad right here. See how that epicardial fat pad is outlined by the fluid and moves with the heart? And so that's another something I'd point out here. Just pointing out some findings that I expect to see right in heart. I expect to see fat pads. Luckily, fat pads are less than one centimeter in thickness almost always. And so if you're wondering whether it's a clot or a fat pad, clots certainly can get a lot larger than one centimeter. And uh, these are one centimeter hash marks along the edge of the screen. 
quick way to eyeball anything on ultrasound, any ultrasound machine, any manufacturer, is to look at the dots along the side of the screen. And they usually mean one centimeter hash marks. When you switch to the linear probe, in the near field, sometimes that those one centimeter hash marks change to be 0.5 centimeter hash marks. So just keep that in mind with the linear probe. Sometimes those ones are now 0.5s. But certainly with the phased array transducer, these are one centimeter hash marks. All right, what do you think's going on here? Well, I already have it labeled for you as tamponade. So, you know, I can see this heart swinging back and forth. And that's another sign that the patient's in tamponade is the, is the uh, you would expect to see electrical alternance here, that the heart is actually swinging back and forth, tethered by its great vessels back and forth that way. And this patient also has a pericardial, little epicardial fat pad going on there as well. We can see on the outside of that RV, there's this kind of subtle, but there's a little fat pad going on there. Um, okay, now, this was a patient who was seen in my emergency department uh, last summer in July by a fourth year medical student doing my rotation. And uh, the patient, it wasn't, I wasn't working that day. This was one of my colleague's patients. The patient was in bed five and had, um, was complaining of severe abdominal pain. They also had hypotension. And uh, in the workup, um, they were really concerned about ascending cholangitis. Patient um, had elevated white blood cell count, was complaining of abdominal pain, though there was a huge language barrier. Um, this guy spoke Vietnamese and he was in a lot of pain, so he was hard, even with the interpreter, it was really hard to get a good history from him. So, so here's this medical student doing this ultrasound, looking at his gallbladder. And we can see his gallbladder here at the top of the screen. Now just kind of watch everything that's going on here. What do you see? Anything concerning yet? No? Yeah, down here in the corner, there's this pericardial effusion. And actually, uh, this patient's got a pretty significant pericardial effusion. And, um, you know, it's hard to tell from this particular view whether, you know, there's really tamponade physiology going on here. But in the setting of a patient with at least a two centimeter pericardial stripe here who's hypotensive, and when we got a little bit better history, when we control his symptoms, yeah, maybe he was a little bit more short of breath than he had abdominal pain. What started out as abdominal pain turned out to really be more shortness of breath, and that's just the nature of emergency medicine. We only have so much data, uh, but certainly here's that liver over here. We're doing a, trying to give you a sub xiphoid view. He didn't have much of a liver to see the heart with, but we got enough to see this large effusion here, and the patient, the medical student immediately uh, found the attending, notified them. The attending came to the bedside, saw this, and they called cardiology who did um, uh, uh, pericardiocentesis in the cath lab. Now, uh, one final thing about the pump is with RV strain. And with pulmonary embolism, we know that um, in a setting of shock um, and known pulmonary embolism, that thrombolytics are recommended. Um, and the problem with echo is that um, you can't rely on a negative study to say the patient does not have a PE. So I can't have a patient who I'm, who is at risk for pulmonary embolism, do an echo and have it, there be no evidence of RV strain and say, oh, there's no PE. So the negative predictive value is not good here. So I wouldn't want you to ever be lured into somebody saying, go in there and tell me that patient doesn't have a PE by showing me that their right ventricle is not bigger than the left ventricle. Because in smaller early PEs, that physiology hasn't happened yet. It's only with massive PE do we see the, um, the right atrium, the right ventricle start to dilate out, okay? And I think the best view to look for this is in the apical four-chambered view. And just keep in mind that if the patient has pulmonary hypertension, COPD, these are also things that can cause a right ventricular strain picture on ultrasound. So, uh, you know, we don't get a lot of patients with COPD at UC Irvine for whatever reason compared to other places where I've worked. And maybe there's just less smokers around Orange County than in other centers. I'm not really sure. But uh, lucky for us with doing ultrasound of the heart, um, we don't have that confounder too much. But in the setting of COPD or pulmonary hypertension, you got to be very careful how you interpret anything with echo. 
Now, this is an example here of somebody who's got RV strain. And we can see this is what axis of the heart? Parasternal long, very good. So this is the left atrium. Here's the left ventricle, aortic outflow tract. There's my aortic valve, has to be closed right now. And this is the right ventricle, bigger than the LV. Normally, the right ventricle should be two-thirds the size of the left ventricle. Okay? That's in all of us sitting in this room right now. But with pulmonary embolism, massive pulmonary embolism causing shock, that right ventricle is trying to pump against that clot in the pulmonary artery, so it's got nowhere to go. The blood's got nowhere to go, so the RV is getting bigger and bigger. Completely makes sense from a logical standpoint, which is what I love about this pulmonary embolism stuff. Here's another, this is another patient. This guy was an employee of the hospital who came in to our emergency department coding, okay? Everybody recognized him. He was an employee. Uh, one of the things that sort of helped to give it away was the fact that he had an external fixation device on his lower extremity. He had just gone home from having orthopedic surgery a couple days earlier, still had the X-fix on. And, you know, that was the big tip-off of why somebody would be coding. Of course, we looked at his heart like we do any other code. And this is not the prettiest view. Uh, I'll give you that, but this is what they got. It's trying to be an apical four-chamber. And... Uh, this is the left ventricle over here, and this is the right ventricle over here. Can you see how much bigger the right ventricle is than the left ventricle? And that, combined with the X-fix, um, and this patient who was undergoing, um, at the time, CPR, uh, resulted in thrombolytics being pushed. Thrombolytics were pushed, and the guy had, like, 10 minutes later, almost complete uh, resolution of his hypotension. So this echo that you're seeing right here was actually taken up in the ICU. We went upstairs and we did another echo later on, two hours later in the ICU, where the man was extubated eating dinner. And this was the echo that we saw up there. Still had the RV strain picture going on here, uh, but uh, anyways, this was a big save um, and we're having problems getting an ultrasound machine. This is our old ultrasound machine. And uh, a month later we had a brand new ultrasound machine in our emergency department. It's amazing how something like that can really go a long way. This is another patient who we're trying to do. This is not pretty, but it's an apical four-chambered view. It's an old, old scan. This is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle here. I'll let this play itself out for you. LV smaller than the RV. Here's the parasternal long axis, big RV, small LV, and this patient with basically pulmonary embolism. Here's another patient here. What axis of the heart is this? Parasternal long. I know it's a little funky to look at because things are a little squished here, but that's parasternal long. We see essentially an empty left ventricle and a big right ventricle in the setting of pulmonary embolism. In this patient, I would definitely think about pushing thrombolytics, and obviously they're in shock. They've got a big RV, um, and in this case, they're coding. It doesn't hurt to push the thrombolytics. This uh, images were sent to me by my friend at OHSU, uh, Dr. Ilgen, and we can see here um, in the apical four chamber in the parasternal long, this patient's got a massive pulmonary embolism. We can see the LV smaller than the right ventricle in that apical four chamber, and over here we see the RV larger than the LV in this parasternal long axis. Okay. Now, we talked about the pump. Yes? Yeah. So the McConnell sign, the right ventricular free wall, standing there, not doing anything. But the apex is still doing its thing up here. Yeah, it's a cool example of that, actually. All right. Now, moving on. The tank. And uh, what we do when we, when we think about the tank is what's going on with the tank. Is the tank full? Is the tank leaking out somewhere? And the first thing I think about with the tank is uh, the central venous pressure. And this is a big topic uh, right now with septic patients. We want to estimate their central venous pressure and um, because the early goal directive therapy of patients in sepsis is um, 
the standard is to check for the central venous pressure. And the way people currently do it is invasively with um, you know, a, a line placed, a central line placed down into the right atrium of the heart, and then a transducer um, is in there sensing what the pressure is, okay? And that is read out on the monitor as a number. Um, and it's very invasive because we have to cannulate the IJ and get all the way down to the right atrium of the heart and place a sensor in there. But you can actually estimate it non-invasively using the IVC diameter. So I'm going to show you guys this briefly, and we can practice. We're going to practice all this stuff today, but I just want to show you this to you briefly. So it turns out that the IVC, as you know, dumps into the right atrium of the heart, and therefore uh, there's it's proportional to what the right atrial pressure is. As you breathe in, as you inspire, the diameter of the IVC should decrease. Okay, and as you expire, um, it it uh, goes back up again, basically. And so patients who have high intravascular volumes, they don't really see much change during inspiration of their IVC diameters. Whereas patients with low intravascular volumes or low CVPs, you do see a lot of flattening out of the IVC during inspiration. Let me show you what I mean here. So first off the bat, where do you stick the probe? You put it right here along the parasagittal to the right in the sagittal view. So we have the indicator of the patient's head in the sagittal view, and I say right parasagittal. What does that mean? Sagittal means right down the center of the body. Parasagittal means just off to one side or the other. If I want to see a long axis of the aorta, I go left parasagittal. If I want to see a long axis of the IVC, I go right parasagittal, okay? Sometimes it helps as they're doing that picture to angulate the probe up a little bit and then you should see right underneath the liver the inferior vena cava coming along and dumping into the right atrium of the heart. And uh, in patients who have an IVC less than two centimeters to begin with, before they even do any inspiratory anything, less than two centimeters, and then it collapses by more than 50% with inspiration, the pressure in the right atrium is said to be less than 10 millimeters of mercury. And if it's more than two centimeters before you inspire, and when you breathe in, nothing really happens to it, it doesn't compress by more than 50%, then you're said to have a CVP greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Okay, and that's basically how this works. So, what does it look like? This is the IVC right here. Okay, I see it going along. The IVC's got very thin, flat, black walls to it, as opposed to the portal vein that's got very hyper-echoic walls to it, okay? And this is a patient who's breathing in and out and has a two centimeter IVC that is not changing at all with respiration. So this patient would have a CVP greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. Adequately hydrated. Okay. As opposed to this little skinny CVP right here, look at this. I mean IVC right here. I mean this thing is definitely, you know, less than two centimeters. Uh, and as they inspire, it flattens all the way out. So we start out less than two centimeters, and as you as the patient breathes in, the IVC actually flattens all the way down, and the walls basically touch in this case. And so that patient's got a central venous pressure less than 10 millimeters of mercury. Does that make sense? Okay, so in terms of the tank, we wanna know is the tank full. The other thing with the tank is, is there a hole in the tank, or is the tank somehow compromised? So if there's a hole in the tank, we can do the FAST exam, and we can look for fluid in between the spleen and the kidney or between the liver and the kidney. And as I'm sure you're aware, the spleen and the liver look very similar on ultrasound. It's hard for me to tell which side I'm on uh, just by looking at uh, a video. Uh, but this is basically what it looks like. And if you've got fluid there between the spleen or liver and the kidney, then um, that suggests that the tank has been compromised and it's there's blood or fluid leaking out into the peritoneal cavity. And Morrison's pouch, or the hepatorenal area, is the most dependent portion of the peritoneal cavity. Now, if you wanted to increase the sensitivity of Morrison's pouch to pick up any free fluid in the peritoneal cavity, you can put the patient in Trendelenburg, and that will help fluid that's maybe hanging out in the pelvis come up into Morrison's pouch. And you can even roll the patient a little bit of right lateral decubitus. That will also increase the sensitivity of your Morrison's pouch view. 
Because the liver's bigger than the spleen, I do prefer the Morrison's pouch view when I'm going through my fast scan windows. That's the easiest one to get that view of an organ next to the kidney. Now, the other thing is uh, pneumothorax. And uh, I'm not going to cover that in this lecture either, um, but we will cover it, say, on hands-on. If you have a, a pneumothorax, that will actually also compromise the filling of your tank, especially with a tension pneumothorax, um, because that can push against the return of the blood vessels coming back to the heart, so shifting the mediastinal contents and pinching off the flow of blood going back to the heart. So that can actually compromise your tank as well. Okay, so we got the pump, we got the tank, and then the last thing is the pipes, okay? Now, with the pipes, what are we talking about? Really two main pipes. We can either have a pipe rupture in terms of the abdominal aortic aneurysm rupturing, or we can have a clogged pipe like a defane thrombosis, okay? And first we'll talk about AAA. Now, with AAA, you're going to have that uh, indicator aimed to the patient's right, and you could use either the C60 or the P21, um, either the phased array transducer or the large footprint curved probe, indicator aimed to the patient's right, and what you're looking for is either a fusiform or a saccular aneurysm. What's the difference? A fusiform aneurysm is one that is concentrically dilated, okay? A saccular aneurysm where you have an aneurysm hanging off to the side of the aorta. And the transverse view picks up both saccular and, uh, and um, fusiform aneurysms. And what you're looking for, the aorta, is just left of the spine shadow. So we can see it right here. This is the spine shadow. Here's the aorta just to the left of the spine shadow. That's our IVC. The other vasculature is interesting to talk about, but really, for this purpose of this talk, we're really just looking for that aorta there, left of the spine shadow. Remember, the indicator is the patient's right. And what you're going to do is you're going to start up high in the epigastrium. You're going to push down with the indicator of the patient's right, and you're going to examine um, the entire aorta as it goes down to the bifurcation. Okay, and sometimes you get a little gassed out, and that's okay. So here's the spine shadow right here. This is the aorta. And we're going to go all the way up until we see that celiac axis. Uh, not that critical, uh, the names of the vasculature, but you're going to come up to that epigastric area, and then you're going to walk further south. Here's the spine shadow. Here's the aorta here. Um, now we get a loop of bowel here in the way, and you're going to experience that quite often where there's a loop of bowel in the way, and you're wondering what's going on. That's okay. You just walk right past that loop of bowel, and then you've got your spine shadow and your aorta back again. Many times I push with both hands in order to get the spine shadow to come in. So you can compress a loop of bowel. It, get, it squirts out of the way, or just the walls come together. The air is no longer there, and then you can see your aorta again. And as we move distally, the aorta gets more superficial, so it's important to decrease our depth as we're moving distally so that the aorta takes up the majority of the screen. And eventually, we reach another loop of bowel here, but eventually, this aorta should bifurcate. I walk right past that loop of bowel, and I should see this become two structures as it did right there. And that's how you do it, all the way down to the bifurcation where you see snake eyes. Once you see snake eyes above the spine shadow, you're done. Move on to something else. And when you see an abdominal aortic aneurysm, it looks like this. This one happens to have a large mural thrombus to it. We can see this thrombus kind of coming along here. And by the way, that thrombus, that mural thrombus is dampening, has a dampening effect. What do I mean by that? As the true lumen of the aorta is pulsating, the mural thrombus is dampening the pulsatility and makes it um, sometimes difficult to palpate on a physical exam, which is why the physical exam's got about a coin toss for sensitivity for picking up an abdominal aortic aneurysm, even one this large. This is about, you know, 8, 9, 10 centimeters. And even one this large, because of all that mural thrombus, that dampens the pulsatility, making it difficult to pick up on physical exam. And then finally, looking for clogged pipes or uh, a DVT. Now, there's two ways to do a DVT study. You've got the, um, the comprehensive uh, method uh, that's been really used in radiology over the years, or there's the two-point method, looking in the FEM and the POP. And um, there was a, a good article that looked at this, comparing the two, and even after 2,100 consecutive patients who were randomized in this multi-center prospective study, they found that the two-point compression technique had no difference in the outcome of the patient to the whole leg color ultrasound group. And so how do we do this two-point technique? It's pretty straightforward. 
um, we've got the uh, superficial femoral artery here, the deep femoral artery, and the common femoral vein. At this location, we're very proximal, and what we're trying to do is to compress the femoral vein walls to one another. Now, if you look at this uh, leg here, which, I, I should say, as you look at this image here, assuming the indicator is the patient's right, which leg is this, the left leg or the right leg? Left, left leg, very good. The way I remember that is venous is closest to the penis. Venous penis is how I remember the medial lateral configuration of the femoral vasculature. And we know that the femoral vein uh, courses its way down the leg. And this area right here, it goes into the superficial femoral canal or adductor canal where it's very difficult to insinate. But then eventually comes in the popliteal area where it gets easy to see again. And so you're going to be looking really just up here and about uh, the protocol is at the inguinal ligament and then you march in one centimeter increments for five centimeters or five compressions. But I'll tell you, come down as far as you can until you lose it because it's good practice uh, and uh, it only takes a few extra moments to come down about halfway down the thigh. So I usually come down a third or halfway down the thigh and then I, I can no longer see the femoral vein anymore and then I move over to the popliteal area. In the popliteal area, um, the skin line is up here and now the vein is the closest thing to the skin line. or The vein is more superficial compared to the artery uh, down here. And uh, what I do is I take my other hand, my left hand in this case, and I put it on the patient's knee, and I take my right hand on the probe, and I just compress these two things together, keeping in mind that in the popliteal fossa, the vein comes to the top in the pop. Now, when it's negative, here we're back in the fem, um, and so here's the common femoral vein, here's the common femoral artery. This is without compression. This happens to be the saphenous vein. So which leg is this? The right leg. And then with compression, the venous structures all disappear. And so that's the still image protocol. On a video, it looks like this. This is also the right leg. Superficial and deep femoral arteries, common femoral vein, we see good compression there. And they're just walking distally as they go. They had to actually increase their depth. And then the video clip starts again. But we see good uh, wall coaptation, or meaning that the vein walls come together. And this is what it looks like when you've got a clot. Here's the common femoral vein. Femoral arteries are over here. Non-compressible femoral vein. And that means DVT. Now, once you identify a clot, then you want to stop compressing because you don't want to dislodge the clot. You want to go tell somebody right away. Hopefully, you've captured some video, some images of it, and then um, you can show those videos to somebody else so that they can do something about it. Now, in the popliteal fossa, here's the artery down here. Here's the vein up here. We see nice compressibility of the vein. The artery is still open. So therefore, this patient definitely does not have a clot. As opposed to right here, here's the artery. It's actually pulsatile. And here's the vein up here. We compress so hard that the artery actually starts to wink back at us. That's pushing a bit hard. Um, clearly, once we get the diagnosis, we don't want to start moving this around too much. We don't want to dislodge that. But that's the idea. That's a nice positive popliteal vein DVT there. So, in summary, with the pump, um, it's all about the pro placement. We talked about the three views of the heart and what we're looking for, global LV, global LV function, whether there's some type of obstructive process like a pericardial effusion or RV strain. And with the tank, uh, what we're looking for here is the IVC as a non-invasive measure of CVP. We're looking for, in other words, is the tank full? And then finally, we're looking if there's any holes in the tank, like with the FAST exam, and uh, if there's a, a pneumothorax um, resulting in a compromise of our tank. And then the pipes, uh, we do an abdominal aortic aneurysm exam from the epigastrium all the way down to the bifurcation, and we're going to be looking uh, also for clogged pipes, like in the FEM and the POP. So just keep in mind, in the heat of the battle, uh, the pump, the tank, and the pipes, and you should be able to uh, complete this study uh, pretty quickly in the setting of unexplained hypotension.